The Miller's Tale, A Barrel of Laughs Down at Osney Mead in Oxford lived a carpenter called Oswald, a crusty old misery, just like him over there. But he had married a pretty young thing called Allison. Now everyone was in love with Allison. She was as pert and as pretty as a squirrel up a tree, though to tell the truth, she should not have flirted so much with men. Most of the time she was only joking, like with poor Absalom, the clerk. But Absalom got quite the wrong idea. He was all set to elope with her whenever she said the word. Nicholas was a different pot of jam. Nicholas was a lodger in the carpenter's house, and Allison just could not take her eyes off him. He was allowed to steal a kiss in the dark of the larder, and while he helped her hang out the washing. The carpenter, knowing he wasn't the prettiest duck on the pond, was fearfully jealous about his pretty young wife. He never let her go out alone, and trusted her in the company of no man except Nicholas. Nicholas is an educated man, he would tell his neighbors proudly, a clever man, a religious man. It was true that Nicholas was clever. It was he who thought up the plot, after all, a plot to make an utter fool of the carpenter. He whispered the plot to Allison, who giggled behind her hand. Then he went to his room with food enough for a fortnight and locked himself in. "'Where's Nicholas?' said the carpenter three days later. "'He hasn't eaten with us since Monday.' Then Allison wrung her hands. "'I'm worried about him, husband. "'He locked himself in his room on Monday with nothing to eat. "'He won't answer to knocking. "'He must be ill. "'But what can I do?' "'Well, why didn't you say so, woman?' The carpenter leaped up the stairs and hammered on the lodger's door. "'Nicholas! Nicholas, old son! Open up, won't you?' And when he got no answer, he threw himself against the door until it fell off its hinges. There sat Nicholas, bolt upright, on the edge of his bed. His eyes were lifted towards the ceiling, and a strange humming came from his nose. Mm. Lord have mercy, I told you he was religious, cried Oswald. He's in some kind of trance. He's seeing visions. And shaking Nicholas by the hair, he shouted in his ear, Wake up, boy! Snap out of it! One blink, two blinks, and Nicholas closed his mouth with a sigh. Ah, oh, brother Oswald, I've been visited by the angels, and they showed me such visions. What? Tell us what? Then Nicholas clapped the carpenter in an embrace and said tearfully, You've been like a father to me, so I'm going to tell you a terrible secret. The angels themselves revealed it to me. The end of the world is coming. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, said the carpenter, crossing himself. What? Fire and brimstone? No, no, said Nicholas in the most saintly of voices. You remember Noah? Well, of course I remember Noah, Oswald burst out excitedly. Noah who? Nicholas sighed with all the patience of a holy martyr. You remember how in the Bible we are told that God sent rain for forty days and forty nights and the whole world was drowned, except for Noah, who built an ark, that's to say, a boat, and he floated to safety and started up the human race all over again after the flood dried up. Is it rain, then? Are we all to be drowned, me and you and little Allison and the cat? After all, said Nicholas in sepulchral tones, unless... He told the carpenter to fetch three big watertight barrels and to hang them up among the roof beams of the house by stout hemp ropes, a barrel for each of them. When the rains come, the flood will rise and rise until it sets the barrels afloat. Then, at a given signal, we shall cut the ropes and float away on the tide. 
take a bite of cheese and bread and cheese up there with you. We may be floating about for some time before God ends the flood. Calling down blessings from heaven on Nicholas, the carpenter hung the three barrels in the roof, climbed into one, and sat waiting for the flood. When after an hour or so it got boring waiting for the flood, he dozed off and dreamt he was ruling the empty world with Allison on one side of his throne and Nicholas on the other. Down below, Nicholas and Allison fell into each other's arms in fits of helpless, silent laughter. They sat on the settle and held hands and kissed and carried on until the darkest hours of the night when the whole town was asleep. A sudden soft tapping on the shutters made them both sit up with a start. It was followed by a quiet, high-pitched coo. Allison, it's me. It's Absalom. Allison, sugar pie, honeybee, baby bubbles, chickadee, give me a kiss, won't you? Everyone's asleep but you and me. Even the moon's hiding herself tonight. Now we can steal a kiss, can't we? Allison clapped her hand over her mouth, then whispered, What shall I do, Nicholas? He'll wake Oswald. Sure enough, a bleary voice from overhead said, Has the flood come? Is it time yet? No, dear. Go back to sleep, called Allison and soon snores were rending the rafters like a bow-saw. But still Absalom was at the window. "'What shall I do?' hissed Allison. "'I suppose he must have his kiss,' said Nicholas, rising from the settle. The window was high up, higher than a man's head. In a voice as high as a filleted cod, Nicholas whispered through the shutter, "'Dearest boy, how I've longed for this moment!' But close your eyes. It's not fitting that a woman should be seen in her night clothes, even on the darkest of nights, and even by one she loves so dearly. And he leaned out the window to plant a kiss on Absalom's waiting lips. Allison burst into such a fit of giggles that she had to stuff her apron into her mouth, and still the laughter snorted and snuffled in through her nose. Down in the street, Absalom heard the giggle, felt the Nicholas's beard tickle his chin, and guessed at the truth. He danced off down the road with such a heat of temper that his vest all but scorched. But not one sound escaped his lips, only silent, wicked curses. Nicholas gave that little snigger of his, and they returned to the settle to complete unfinished business. Tap, tap, tap. Absalom was back again. Allison, dearest, that one kiss has fired such love in me that I shan't sleep a wink without you. Kiss me again. Oh, make him be quiet, Nicholas, hissed Allison, and Nicholas smirked. Going to the window, he called through the shutters. This must be the last, dear heart. Now close your eyes, won't you? You may kiss me now. And edging on to the window sill, he preferred Absalom the seat of his pants. Absalom was waiting for him. He had been to the forge and heated a branding iron in the blacksmith's fire. Now he stood brandishing it like the devil with his pitchfork. And as Nicholas's trousers came through the window, Absalom lunged. They heard the scream in Banbury. Up in his barrel, the carpenter woke to hear a noise very like the end of the world, and Nicholas's voice yelling, Water! Water! as he galloped around the room and fell over the settle. It's come! The rains have come! thought Oswald, and cut through the ropes, tying his barrel to the roof, thinking to float away. He dropped like a stone, right on top of the settle, his wife and the lodger. The cat who had been sleeping in Oswald's lap, gave a yowl and leapt out of the window. It found the street full of neighbors tumbling out of their beds and out of their doors to find the cause of the commotion. 
The neighbors found Oswald, Nicholas, and Allison, the settle, a barrel, and a plentiful supply of bread and cheese all squandered in a heap. The carpenter was shrieking, It's the end of the world! Swim for your lives! A trickle of smoke was still rising from the seat of the lodger's trousers. Who said what and whether they were believed, I shan't ever know. For at this point, the reeve came back with a tongue like a fly swat and demanded that the miller be disqualified from the competition. He only told that story to spite me. I'm a carpenter, aren't I? I'm called Oswald, aren't I? I thought he was going to chew the ears off his horse. He looked so aggrieved. Then the prioress, Eglinton, chimed in. Oh, you've made me blush, Master Miller. Regardez, monsieur, je suis blushing, she exclaimed, fanning her snow-white cheeks. By St. Louis, what a coarse story! She adjusted her wimple so that it sat well back on her forehead. What we really want, she said coyly, is a nice story about nice people. No one will mind me saying so, but if we start having stories about lower class people, we're bound to end up with nasty stories like that. We want a finer sort of story altogether. Glowing phrases, uplifting thoughts. I'm sure there's someone here who can tell us a story in the grand style. The miller scowled at her. Lower class of people indeed. I suppose you want stuff about princesses and heroic princes galloping about on chargers spouting bits of Latin. Prioress Eglinton sniffed. Fancy you knowing about romantic literature, a man of your low breeding. <laughs>